Hey, Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here. Thank you for joining us for another Monday Market Update, 9 a.m. Eastern, every Monday morning, Tuesday this week because of the holiday yesterday. And we've seen AI stocks just shoot the moon this year with shares of NVIDIA up 197%, shares of C3 AI up even higher, up more, almost 300%. But what if that share price crashes back lower? I mean, we've seen this movie before, right? Shares of NVIDIA jumped 150% in the 11 months to November 2021, only to crash down 62% in the next 10 months, completely wiping out those pandemic gains. So we see that the only real return is the one you book by either taking profits or collecting that cash dividend. Now, of course, these fast-growing AI stocks aren't going to be paying a dividend anytime soon. Hell, Amazon has been public since 1997 and hasn't paid a dividend yet. But there is a way to create your own dividend from these AI stocks. One company is actually making it very easy, but I'm going to show you how to do it for all the AI stocks in a minute. Be sure to stick around after that. We're going to cover our Monday market update, the stocks I'm watching this week, the economic news you need to see. Now, recently, Yieldmax has come out and launched four ETFs based on single stocks. Here you see Apple, Tesla, the ARK fund, the ARKK fund, and NVIDIA, this NVDY fund, and is paying out a current yield of 16 to 59% in dividends on these ETFs. Now, I'm going to explain how these works, the risks, and really the truth about these dividend yields. Then I'm going to show you how to create your own more reasonable dividend from your favorite AI stocks. We'll use the Yieldmax NVDA Income ETF, that's ticker NVDY as an example here. Since we're talking about NVIDIA, uh, this is an actively managed fund run by Yieldmax to generate monthly income through selling call options on those shares of NVIDIA. And, and while that might sound a lot like those covered call income ETFs like the QYLD that, that are so popular, there is an important twist. So if we scroll down here to the holdings of this, we can actually see how they're doing this and what is in this. Now, instead of actually buying shares of NVIDIA, the NVDY here is using options to create a synthetic stock position. Now, this is a little complicated. I'm going to get into how this works and how you can set this something like this up on your own a lot easier. You can see here in the holdings, though, on this website, it is long $713,000 in call options. Okay, so you have these... NVIDIA US July 21st call options for $425 stock price. This uh, they're, they're using a month by month basis and they have those call options worth $700,000 at the strike price of $425. That is right around the, um, the current price of NVIDIA. So they're long those. That gives them the right to buy shares of NVIDIA at $425 in those uh you know over the next month to july 21st at the same time they are also short 600 or 580,000 down here 580,000 in put options so they've sold these put options to another investor that gives another investor the right to uh to put these to put these back onto uh onto onto the the fund to sell these to the fund at that $425 strike price for 580,000 total in notational value here. Now, that is what's called a synthetic stock position. Just those two, buying puts or buying call options and buy, selling put options at the same strike price, the same expiration. That is technically the exact same profit position or profit profile as owning the stock outright. It's very complicated in how these are set up and the math behind this, but the math does work out where they will, with the, just those two options contracts, the buying the call options, selling the puts, they'll come out exactly the same as if they would have uh, bought the stock outright. What this does, though, is it allows them to use leverage in this. So it's a much, uh, much cheaper position than going out and buying all those contracts. Those, you know, 28, 28,500 shares of NVIDIA would have cost a lot more just to buy those shares on the market for that $425 strike price. What they can do is they can get a leverage position here with the, the call and the put options and then invest the rest. You see here they have over 80% of the fund's value in United States Treasury bills, okay? So very safe T-bills, they earn a yield on those T-bills and, uh, and they don't have to have that much money wrapped up in the stock all at once. That's how it creates the stock position. Now, how it creates the monthly dividend, it's actually selling a weekly call options. A, a lot of these other income ETFs like the QYLD will look at, they sell those monthly call options, they do it on a month by month basis, the the yield max is actually doing it here on a week to week basis so every week they will sell call options against some of that position in nvidia for a higher strike price so right here we see they have 
um, these call options sold for options expiration on 623 that would be one week at $450 strike price and the not notational value of that they collected just over $92,000 to pay those dividends on that on that fund and this is similar to what a lot of those other covered call ETS like the QYLD are doing we can go down here to holdings and see what the QYLD has you see in the options detail here so actually the QYLD that NASDAQ 100 ETF they own the shares in the NASDAQ 100 those 100 stocks mostly tech stocks faster growing stocks like Microsoft Nvidia Amazon there but then each month they sell those uh, they sell those call options here you can see the QYLD is doing it on a month-to-month -month basis so they've sold the July 21st options rather than doing it every single week there's a few other very important differences here also so you can see here that the they've sold call options on the NASDAQ for a strike price of 15,200 now if we look over here and see where the NASDAQ is trading at it's trading at 13,689 so the NASDAQ would have to rise by 15,200 is the strike price on those calls that is the point where they would have to sell the their shares of NASDAQ for that price if it rose that high by July 21st so divided by 13,689 so the NASDAQ would have to rise by 11% for the QYLD to start losing money on those call options okay it has sold another right investor the right to buy those shares or buy the NASDAQ from them at 15,200 those shares would have to take off by 11% just in the next month for for them to start losing money for the QYLD to start losing money on that position now if we go back to the NVDY here we see that they have sold those calls those Nvidia calls over the next week for a strike price of four hundred and fifty dollars okay so that means if Nvidia rises up to four hundred and fifty dollars they start losing money on that right so that's four four fifty divided by this current stock price that's about five point six percent so again pretty far outside of the of the current stock price if Nvidia shares would have to jump higher by almost six percent for them to start getting called away on these shares of Nvidia so what we have with these yield max ETFs is a very interesting way to collect dividends off of these very popular stocks Apple Tesla Nvidia there are a few things that worry me here though one is just looking at the price chart in this and we do have very limited data on this yield max ETF only being out for about a month now but you can see that when shares of Nvidia have jumped and this you see this in all those income ETFs that it has underperformed just a straight ownership of those shares basically those shares jumped past the call options that they were writing on that stock those those shares got called away they lost money on those call options so while they were able to pay out a very strong dividend yield you actually lost money from just compared to just owning the stock outright beyond that I think it's going to be very difficult or if not impossible for the managers of these funds to keep up that high of a dividend yield you know 20 30 40 percent dividend yield you do not do that without taking a substantial risk and positioning in the market on on a single stock here to create that dividend yield the manager is selling more call options each month than, than compared to what we see in a lot of these other income ETFs like the QYLD if we look at the QYLD you can see here on the QYLD page the notational exposure so the the amount at risk here with those call short call options is about eight million dollars that is about one percent of the eight billion dollars AUM the assets under management for the fund here for the QYLD now if we compare that to the in VDY here then Nvidia ETF they are selling about three quarters of a percent you see here three quarters of a percent that ninety two thousand uh, dollars in call options they've sold each week but that is on a weekly basis again here so each week they are having to sell about three quarters of a percent of the fund assets to another investor on that options so we do see a few very important risks on these high yield or single stock ETFs that might not be able to be avoided you know on the one hand if you if you see these stocks like Nvidia jump over the last month like we've seen in that chart previously then that fund is going to underperform just a straight ownership in those shares they're going to get those shares called away from them at a lower price and they're not going to be able to participate quite as much in that uh, in that return on those shares on the other hand if shares of Nvidia do come down the premium and the yield on the uh, on that is going to come down as well um, so it's kind of a, a lose-lose situation a lot of times unless the stock just stays flat uh, also since these are one stock ETFs uh, compared to rather than maybe an index ETF like the QYLD 
the volatility and those risks are just going to be multiplied on these. There is another way, though, to create a dividend on any stock you own, AI stocks or otherwise, and it's going to be using that same covered call strategy. So just selling call options against a position to create that cash value. And I'm going to show you how to do it much simpler than some of these synthetic call options and maybe a little bit uh, less risk than what you'll find in some of these income ETFs. We're going to use C3 AI, ticker AI here, as an example. So say you own a thousand shares here that'd be worth about $45,000. Okay. So you've got $45,000 in shares of uh, ticker AI. If you want that monthly dividend cash flow, then each month you would have to sell some call options. That is the covered calls option strategy. So you would go here to the options available in that stock. And here, let's say you want a reasonable 10% annual dividend here. So I don't recommend going too high. You don't need to create a 20 or 30% annual dividend like you see with these yield max ETFs. You just want something that's going to pay the bills, participate in the upside in that stock, but still create some kind of a cash flow on that. So if you want a 10% annual dividend on that $45,000 value of those shares, you, go, you just go 10% times 45,000, you want about a $4,500 dividend divided by 12. So that's about a $375 you want to collect each month from these call options, from selling the right to another investor to buy those shares from you. So if we're doing that on a month by month basis, which is much easier than week by week. So I highly recommend just doing month by month. We can go here and find the July 21st call options, scroll down to where we want. And the key to this is going to be how many call options you sell against your thousand shares. So how many of your shares, your thousand shares that you own, you put at risk with this call option. Cause remember what you're doing, you're selling another investor the right to buy those shares at a specific price over the next month. You're collecting that cash from them to generate that dividend, but you are giving them the right to buy those at that specific price. So you've got a thousand shares here. You, you can see the, the strike prices all the way down here. Now we know that Nvidia is selling for a $45 or excuse me, AI selling for $45 a share right now. If we were to sell these $45 strike prices to another investor, yes, we collect a very strong $5 and 80 cents dividend off of that shares. But if those shares go up any over the next month, we don't participate in that because that other investor now has the right to buy those shares from us for $45. So we want to go a little bit higher. How high you go is up to you. Depends on how much you need to collect as well as how high you think those shares can go up. Now, again, though, to, co to collect that 10% annual dividend, we only need to collect about $375 each month in dividends more a little bit more a little bit less doesn't matter we just want to know that we can still participate in the upside on that stock without it being called away as well as collect that dividend so if we go down here we can collect if we sell maybe a hundred shares so we only want to put maybe a tenth of our shares at risk maybe even less uh, each month so if we've got a thousand shares now each call option is worth a hundred shares so a minimum we have to put at least a hundred shares at risk here so if we sell one call option that puts 100 shares of our thousand share portfolio at risk for being called away but it does collect that that yield. So if we're collecting, if we can go down here, if we're going to collect right around three dollars and fifty cents a share, we can sell as high as fifty two fifty. OK, so what that means is with those hundred shares that we're putting at risk with this call option, we're selling that call option, that one contract worth 100 shares times three point five. That is going to generate that three hundred and fifty dollars right around three fifty three seventy five for that monthly dividend that we want to collect on our shares of uh, C3 AI. Now, at that 5250 strike price, so that means shares can go up all the way to 5250 from about $45 now. Shares can go up 16% over the next month before we start losing money on it, before those shares potentially get called away and before we uh, we miss out on any upside in that. So we've got a 16% upside in just the stock alone over the next month and we collect that nearly 10% annualized dividend. So again, with this, you can play around with the strike price that you sell those call options at or the number of shares. We could go maybe even a higher strike price, $65, $70 strike price on that. So those shares don't get called away unless shares of uh, C3 AI just jump to the moon to $70. We will collect less per share on that. But if we sell more shares, so if we sell maybe two contracts worth 200 shares or 300 shares, 
then we can still collect that money, that dividend that we want to collect each month. On a position of 1,000 th shares, you really want to only sell maybe one or two contracts a month. That would be against that 100 or 200 shares. So even if the stock price does surge and those shares get pulled away from you, get bought away from you for those call options, then you still have some a big position in that stock and, and can participate in that upside. Uh, selling calls at that much higher strike price here is going to give you, again, a more upside return if the shares do go up higher, but you're going to collect less premium. So maybe you have to sell an additional call option against those. All you out there in the nation know this covered call strategy, one of my favorite option strategies. You know, actually, besides the, just a great way to create that dividend from an AI stock or a non-dividend paying company, this is also a great way to reduce your risk in a stock. Okay, That cash payment you collect is going to reduce the amount that you've got at risk and, and your downside risk in the stock. You know, you've know, you collected that cash payment, sold the right to another investor to buy those shares away from you at a higher stock price. Well, if that stock price goes lower, that investor isn't going to buy those shares from you. You're going to keep the stock, you're going to keep the premium, and you would you have lowered your risk in that stock. I want to talk about a few stocks I'm watching this week in our market update. FedEx here, ticker FDX, going to report its earnings on Tuesday with analysts expecting a big 28% drop in its earnings to $4.90 a share. That would be uh, from, from the quarter last year on expectations really of a 6.7% decline in sales. So what we're seeing here is a slowdown in sales for transportation logistics companies as well well as a real hit to profitability okay it's pointing to a weakening economy as well as really cost issues in that logistics and del delivery space okay despite this the stock has surged 31 percent so far this year on, on hopes for that soft landing and no recession so shares are looking relatively expensive here and risk selling off if we do eventually fall into a recession that's not really why i'm interested in the stock here i think they are a little expensive for my taste right here but i'm watching this report though for just a read on the demand for services that demand for delivery uh, consumer spending it's just an important indicator for the health of the economy. Also watching SoFi Technologies, ticker SOFI, very popular after running 110% just in last month, 80% so far this year. We've been investing in this stock since last year, but it crashed nearly 15% in just three days last week. And most people are blaming this just on valuation and a runaway stock price. Now, I'll agree that a stock running 110% in a month looks overvalued and ready for a pullback, but Understand here, Nation, a higher stock price is rarely the impetus or the turning point for a stock to head lower. Okay, Stocks making those new highs tend to continue that way until something causes investors just to question that direction. Okay, Stocks don't sell off just because they get expensive. They usually need some kind of a catalyst for investors to start questioning that run and to start pulling their money out. Now for SoFi, last week, it really came on fear of an impending Supreme Court decision over Biden's student loan forgiveness program. Okay, what happened here is investors are worried that the court may have telegraphed its decision through a recent ruling. If we see here the, this ruling in Halen versus Bracking, it was a challenge to the Indian Ch Child Welfare Act. Seems totally relate, unrelated to SoFi, but listen here, several states had sued to over turn that act, but the court challenged, the Supreme Court challenged their state's rights, their standing to sue on behalf of others. Okay, it's standing in the matters. The The court actually came out and said, you know what, we really don't see that the states have the right or the standing to sue on behalf of these other par parties that it said had the claim. Okay, and we see a similar argument here in these student loan cases with five states suing the administration, suing Biden and the administration on behalf of a student loan company, okay, Mohila. Now, if the court again here challenges the state's standing, it could lead to uphold that loan forgiveness plan. Okay, so what investors were worried about last week is, that, again, in this case, the court is going to come out and say, you know what, we really don't agree that the states have standing or the right to sue on behalf of these other parties. Now, if it does come out like that, and we are expecting a ruling here within the next two weeks from the Supreme Court, if it does come out like that, I do expect the shares to come down further. Uh, the bottom line though, while upholding that loan forgiveness would likely be a hit to SoFi shares initially, it would not dent the long-term upside of this business, which has really been diversifying away from its student loan segment for years. Okay, I own 18,000 shares still here of SoFi. I'd be a buyer on any post-decision drop. 
it is going to be a relatively quiet week for expected news for the market here. We do see Chair Powell is scheduled to uh, to testify before Congress, before the House on Wednesday and before Senate on Thursday. This recent CPI inflation report that really came in pretty much uh, at expectation. We have seen inflation on that consumer price index uh, come down about half from that 9% we saw last year. Really gave the Fed chair enough to justify holding rates steady in last week's week meetings while still promising to fight inflation in the future with higher rates really basically he can he can talk out of both sides of his mouth to whoever wants to uh, whoever wants to challenge him there in Congress when he speaks on Wednesday and Thursday he can say hey you know what we're going to support the economy by holding rates steady because inflation is coming down but we're going to increase rates uh, in the future to bring inflation down further he can basically really it's best of both worlds for him on that we don't expect a whole lot of uh, gotcha moments in those, uh, in those remarks and that testimony. What I do see as the bigger risk here over the next couple of weeks, in fact, is something that really by happening behind the scenes, very few people are talking about it, and that is quarter end rebalancing. Okay, nation, understand fund managers, these institutional money managers that control trillions of dollars in these fund assets, most have rules for a percentage of stocks and bonds that they have to hold in their investments okay and whether this is on a company-wide or a fund or or just per fund basis most uh you know need to hold somewhere around 60 70 percent of stocks and then the remainder in bonds so 30 or 40 percent in bonds that still gives the, the manager some discretion to uh, maintain those funds invested in the two classes they can have you know maybe 65 percent uh in stocks and 35 percent in bonds and and there's a range there but how this affects the market is when returns vary so much from those two asset classes. When stocks jump and, and bonds don't, or when when stocks fall, that very much determines uh, what they have to do at the end of each quarter when they do their rebalancing. When they look at their portfolios and say, okay, our mandate is for 60% in stocks. Now we have 70% or 80% in stocks. We need to readjust that and rebalance our portfolios down to the mandate. For example, here we see a chart of the S&P 500. That stock market index here has jumped 12% just over the second quarter. That's the April through June period. While a measure of bonds, the bond market, the iShares U.S. Aggregate Bond ETF, that's the AGG here in red, has lost 1.5% over the period. So we've seen stocks jump by 12%. Bonds are down 1.5%. If a fund started the quarter around a mandate of about 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds, that difference in returns it would now hold 63% of its assets in, bond, in stocks and 37% in bonds. Now, it might not seem like a much of a change, but if every fund manager or every fund and every fund manager needs to reposition their portfolio back to that mandate, back to 60-40, it could mean tens of billions of dollars in stock sales that could really weigh on the market. JP Morgan estimates that could mean the largest rebalancing since the fourth quarter of 2021, more than $150 billion in stock sales and knocking as much as 5% off global stock prices. Now that analogy to 2021 is important because it represents the end of the previous bull market. Stocks had jumped 11% in that fourth quarter before, really before starting that years long fall in January. Now, of course, other factors were at play there and, and fund managers could wait until early July here to start selling their stocks, but there's just no avoiding that there is gonna be significant downward pressure in stocks over the next month. It's going to take a very strong investor sentiment and money coming off the sidelines just to support stocks, even where they are right now, against what could be strong selling pressure by institutional managers. Click on the video to the right for five AI stocks cheaper than NVIDIA. The AI stocks ranked on that price valuation. Don't forget to join that Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.